you in control of your own behavior? Put your hands up if you think you are. Well, that's most of you as far as I can see. Well, I'm a behavioral scientist, and I think we're not in control of our own behavior. I think there's invisible forces controlling what we do. Now, before I tell you about that, I'd like to do a small experiment. Um, uh, I need a volunteer. I need somebody in the room to just hop up on their chair for me and sing a song for me. Um, not a difficult thing to do. Volunteers, how about you? Would you do that for me? No? What about you? What about you? You look like you know lots of songs. How about hopping up on the chair and sing it, singing for me? Come on, it's really easy. No one? No one wanting to do it? <laughs> okay, it's fine. You don't have to. <laughs> but why is that so difficult? Why did you laugh and giggle embarrassedly? Why did people refuse to meet my eye? Why, did you, why were you starting to think, oh my God, does she mean me? Does she really want me to do it? Well, that's because we can't do it because we're in a behavior setting. The behavior setting tells us what to do. What is a behavior setting? It's a conjunction of objects, people, and places where we come together to solve problems, to achieve common aims. Behavior settings are a very powerful concept. How do they work? Well, let me give you an example. In fact, we're in a perfect example today. This is a TED Talk. A TED Talk is a particular sort of behavior setting. There are objects in the room that tell us what to do. So you're all sitting on chairs, right? But who told you to face forwards? You could be sitting facing backwards. It was the chair that told you to face forwards, right? Who told you not to lie down? Who told you not to stand on the chair? You're all sitting because the chair told you to sit down. These are objects that control our behavior. That water bottle you're drinking from, it tells you how to do it. In fact, your lives are full of objects that tell you how to behave. They control you. Now take another example. The room. This is an environment, part of a behavior setting. It's a lecture theater. It has walls that tell us to stay inside, not outside. It has an area which tells you where to sit, and it has an area which tells me where to stand. I stand here. The room tells me what to do. It's told the organizers to open the doors and close the doors at the beginning and the end and switch the lights on and off. So we're all slaves to this environment. We do what it tells us. Now, we're all the inhabitants of this behavior setting. We're all playing roles. Kat, introduce me. That's her role. She has to do it. You're the audience. Now, you're a very nice audience. You're a good audience. And what do you do? I just heard you. You laugh at my jokes. <laughs> you smile and you nod. <laughs> you encourage me. And hopefully at the end you'll clap. That's because that's your role. Now what's my role? Well, I stand up here. I'm supposed to tell you something interesting. That's kind of what TED is about, something you don't know. That's the purpose, one of the purposes anyway. So am I in control of this setting? I'm standing up here. It looks like I am, right? But I'm not, because you wouldn't do what I told you to do. I said, stand on a chair and sing a song. Nobody would do it. I'm not in control of the setting. Our roles control the setting. And then there are the rules. Every behavior setting has rules. It might be written rules, like laws, or signs on walls. Or it might be unwritten rules, like the good manners that we all have learned from an early age how to behave, and the social norms of a setting. This TED Talk has a written rule that you can't talk for more than 18 minutes. And it has an unwritten rule, which is you don't turn up in your pajamas. Well, better not to on the whole. You're the audience. You've been an audience how many times? Thousands? Several thousand times probably in your life. You know the rules of being an audience. You face forwards. You don't spit at each other. <laughs> And you certainly don't stand on a chair and sing a song. So our roles control us. Our rules control us. And then if we don't follow the rules, what happens? Social deviance correction, sorry, deviance correction creeps in. So let's say, for example, that those lights were broken. What would happen? Someone would mend them. Or if they couldn't be mended, they'd be thrown out. Now let's say you, the audience, were broken. 
you were behaving badly, what would happen? You'd be corrected or you'd be thrown out. Deviance correction would keep, would keep you behaving in the right way. So let's say you had taken what I suggested. You had done what I wanted. You had stood on the chair and sung a song for me. And then you'd enjoyed it so much you wouldn't sit down. What would have happened? Well, first of all, we'd have started hearing this sound that is the standard sound of social deviance control. It goes like this. <laughs> How many times have you heard that in your life? <laughs> now, if you'd heard that, you would have been embarrassed and you'd have wanted to sit down. But maybe you wouldn't have been affected. Maybe people would have had to shout at you. Shut up! You're interrupting the TED Talk. Sit down. And if you hadn't sat down, we'd have called security and you'd have been chucked out, right? <laughs> so the audience get mended or they get chucked out if they don't behave properly. So all these five factors together, the, the objects, the rules, the roles, the environment, the social deviance, the deviance correction, they conspire to make us behave in certain fixed patterns of behavior. It's a bit like a dance, a choreography, where we all learn the steps at an early age. It's a complex dance, an interacting dance that keeps us behaving in these particular ways. Your lives are full of settings. You may not have noticed it, but from when you get up in the morning from when you go to, to when you go to bed at night, you're in settings. The breakfast table is a setting. As you get on the bus or on the train to work, in a meeting, when you're on the phone, when you're in the pub, when you're in the supermarket, if you don't do the dance, you don't follow the steps, what happens? You get mended or you get kicked out. We have to do what the behavior settings tell us. This is a really powerful concept. It's not one I invented, unfortunately. It's one that was discovered by this guy. He's called Roger Barker. He is known as the father of ecological psychology. He was absolutely fascinated by the fabric of everyday life, and he wanted to understand it better. But he was a bit frustrated by the way standard psychologists would go and try and take behavior to pieces and then poke at it in the lab. He wanted to tell the full story. He wanted to see behavior in the round, in its full context. He wanted to study behavior like a naturalist in the wild. So how did he do that? Well, he created a field station, not in the Wild West, but in the Midwest. He chose a town, a small, typical, normal town, in bang, in the middle of the USA. It was called Oskaloosa in Kansas. It had 800 souls. There was the bank manager. There was a school teacher. There was the newspaper editor. There were the housewives. There were the secretaries. There were the farmers. There were the filling station attendants and the drugstore waitresses. And, of course, lots of children. And he decided to move into that town. He brought his wife, Louise, and his whole family, who grew up in that town. He brought an army of researchers to document daily behavior in that town. In one year, they collected every day of that year, 1954, 100,000 episodes of behavior per day. So the archive now fills a small house some in the University of Kansas. So what did Roger do with all of this data? Well, start it, as a proper psychologist, his original hypothesis, as most people would expect, was that if you knew about people's individual characteristics, you could predict their behavior. So if I know about your motivations, if I know about your personality, if I know about what you're, achieve, what you're planning to achieve in life, I should be able to say something about your behavior. But he was completely shocked to find that wasn't the case. He found that it wasn't individual characteristics that determined how people behave. It was the settings, the behavioral settings. He said that people in the tavern behave tavern. People in the drugstore behave drugstore. People in the post office behave post office. His data showed that if you knew the role that people were playing in a behavior setting, and if you knew the, um, the setting that they were in, you could predict their behavior from year to year with 90% accuracy. Now, there's not much work in psychology that is that predictive. It's an astonishing finding, and one that we think it's really important to revive, because this idea has been forgotten. Why am I so excited about settings? Well, I'm a public health specialist, 
And I want to change behavior. I want to control behavior. Not because I'm evil, <laughs> but because I want people to behave in healthier ways. I want to use the approach that we use, which is called behavior-centered design, to get people to be healthier in the way they eat, to take more exercise, for example, to take their HIV meds, and to wash their hands with soap on key, at key moments. Why washing hands with soap? Well, it's perhaps not too well known, but if everybody in the world today washed their hands with soap, we could save half a million lives a year. That's not bad for a simple bar of soap, right? So how do we get a go about using settings to get people to change their behavior? Here's an example. Now, we were trying to understand um, daily behavior in Andhra Pradesh. And this is a, one of the women that we filmed in our study. She would get up at five o'clock every morning, go to the toilet. And when she'd been to the toilet, she would come back and she'd do this. She'd wash her feet, first of all, and then she'd wash her calves and then she'd wash both arms, she'd wash her face, she'd put some water in her mouth and spit it out. But there was no sign of any soap and no sign of any hand washing. But what was even more shocking about our findings was that she did exactly the same thing every day. You couldn't tell the difference between the films from the different days, and you couldn't tell the difference between the films of all the other women in her village. So this is a fixed pattern of behavior. This is this dance where everybody is behaving the same way because they're held in place, the behavior is held in place by objects, by places, and by people. So how do we disrupt settings? That's what we need to do. So what we did was we came up with a campaign that talked about the social rules. And we said, hand washing with soap is good manners. It's something everybody should do. And then to add a little bit of uh, social control, what we did was um, put these up in all the hand washing locations. <laughs> So a subtle reminder that maybe people were watching you, a bit of social deviance control going on. What was the result of that? Well, um, in those villages before we were working there, something like 4% of women were washing their hands with soap at key moments. Afterwards, it was more like 30%. So the settings disruption worked. Now, this is another, another place, another time, um, more, much more recently in, uh, in Zambia on the front step of this woman's house. She was someone who we'd asked if she would take part in a behavior trial. So, she, so we said to her, you know, would you like to wash your hands with soap for us for, uh, for 10 days? Uh, and then we'll come back and film you. Um, and so we did. And while the filming was going on, I was standing and I was watching what was going on and I was daydreaming a bit. And then suddenly I heard a voice behind me and there was a conversation going on. It was her neighbors chatting. And they were going, what's Amaka doing? What on earth? She's using soap to wash her hands. That's really weird. Is she doing that for? Oh my goodness, she's given the soap to her children. Doesn't she know that kids waste soap? And then I heard another voice saying, Who does she think she is? Does she think she's better than us? That was a, a light bulb moment for me. It was suddenly patently obvious that social deviance control was saying to mothers in Zambia, Don't use this life saving technology, this simple bar of soap. It was stopping her, saving her child's life. So we needed to do something about that. So what we did in Zambia was work with a creative agency to design a series of TV ads. Uh, they featured the Comboni housewives. These are a lovely group of ladies, each one with a different characteristic. And they'd bumble around the village watching what was going on. And they'd go, <coughs> if they saw things that were going on that weren't properly being done properly. But when they saw women washing their hands and breastfeeding properly and, and uh, feeding their children properly, for example, they would congratulate the mums. They would pat them on the back. They'd say, you're doing so well. Fantastic. Come and join us. Come and be a Comboni housewife. Uh, their slogan was Tiku Chekinyani, which uh, translated means we're checking you out, uh, but in a nice way, of course. Now, this is a, a setting, a food preparation setting. Uh, it's in a village in rural Nepal, and it's where my PhD student, Om Gotam, was working. He studied the food that was being fed to the children in these villages, and he showed that there were very high levels of contamination with bacteria in the food. But nobody had ever said anything to these mums about how to prevent that happening. So as a result, kids were falling sick. Now, he knew that it was no good just going and telling women that they should prepare the food properly. I mean, can you imagine if someone came into your kitchen? You know, you know how to prepare food, right? 
You've been doing it since you were young. You do it the way your mother did it. You use the tools that your mother did. You do it. She did it the way her grandmother did it. The way I prepare food is the right way, right? Come in and tell me I'm poisoning my kids. I'll throw you out. Of course I will. So what do we do? So Om thought, well, we go about it a different way. We'll see if we can dis disrupt these settings. So he arranged lots of parties, makeover parties. Local women all got together, all the, the neighbours got together, and they repainted their kitchen. So they transformed the physical setting. They transformed the objects that were in the setting. And they changed the social rules. So, every, so at each one of these parties, the mothers came together and they pledged, I will do the five safe food behaviours. I will cover the food to prevent flies getting into it. I will reheat the food properly to make sure that bacteria don't grow in it. And what, were, what sort of results did he get from that? Well, you can see the behaviours before the intervention and the behaviours after he carried out his, his work. You can see that on average, something like 1 or 2% of people were doing, of mothers, were doing those safe food hygiene behaviours before. And something like 43% were doing all of them afterwards. And he confirmed that there'd been orders of magnitude reduction in microbial contamination in the foods as well. So this is extremely powerful concept, one that we can use in public health. But I don't know, how about you? Have you got behaviours you'd like to change? What would you like to change? Would you like to uh, maybe do more sport? A bit more exercise? I think we'd all like to do that. So here's a trick from behaviour settings. Don't spend the morning thinking, oh, God, I really should go out for a run. <laughs> Just put your kit on. Put your shoes on. Put your running shoes on. Put your track top on. And wait and see what happens. <laughs> the kit takes you out for a run. <laughs> you let it control your behavior. Want to eat less? It's one o'clock, guys. Time for lunch. Let's go. That is a behavior setting. You can edit it out of your life. You don't have to go for lunch. Most of the time you're going for lunch, you're not hungry anyway, are you? Don't have to eat lunch. What about how many of us want more time to concentrate on writing essays or doing something that's important but not urgent? The important things that we always deprioritize because there are urgent things that happen. Change the rules. Put a message on your email that says, I don't answer emails until after 3 o'clock each day. Who's to tell you that you can't do that? You can change your settings. You can control them. Now, you'd think, someone like me, I'm, I'm that era, I'm an ageing hippie, you know? The idea that there are invisible forces coercing me into behaving in ways that I'm not really deciding for myself. You'd think I would hate that idea. But actually, I'm a massive fan of settings. I think they were an incredible cultural invention. I think that we couldn't have achieved all of the astonishing things that Homo sapiens have achieved without settings. Settings helped us build skyscrapers. Setting helped us create universities. Settings have helped us design disposable nappies. And settings have given us TED Talks. Imagine if, for example, every time you got in, into a meeting, you had to design the meeting setting for, from scratch. Nobody knew that you should take turns to speak. Nobody knew what a pencil was for or, or an overhead projector. Nobody knew how to sit at a table or were facing the wrong direction. Would we ever get anything done in meetings if we had to start from scratch? No, we already know the rules of the meeting so we can get there, we can be efficient and we can achieve things together. That is why settings are so powerful. I do think we should start looking at them again, revive the idea, do more science and research on settings because they're useful. I think we need to understand settings better because they control us. And if we understand them, we can control them. Now, according to the rules of the TED Talk, the invisible rules, I should say thank you and you should clap. So, thank you. 